Okay, welcome to our next session. We're uh, delighted to have as our next speaker, Harry Brown. I've known Harry for uh, too long, he says. That's right. <laughs> A well-known investment advisor for 30 years, and I guess I've known him the entire 30 years. Published a renowned newsletter, Harry Brown's Special Reports. And we kind of missed that report. It was uh, extremely well invest, uh, invest, well-written investment newsletter. He has written 11 books and has appeared on uh, hundreds of radio and television shows. And in 1996 and 2000, he was the presidential candidate of the Libertarian Party. Now, his topic today is regarding his book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. And uh, it's, a, it's a great book and a book that is a classic in, uh, in libertarian circles. So please give a ro- warm welcome to Harry Brown. Thank you all. I'm so glad you're here, and thanks for the introduction, Mark. It- never fails if I write the introduction myself. Everything goes like clockwork. I started doing that about 30 years ago when I spoke at an investment conference and the fellow who was going to introduce me was a journalist. And he said, because I'm a journalist, I like to get everything accurate and I don't really know that much about you. So rather than try to fake it, I'm just going to say one simple sentence and then it's your your ball game from there on. I said, well, that's fine with me. And he got up, and that's what he did. He said, our speaker made a million dollars in the gold market in London. Here's Harry Brown. And I stood up to this thunderous ovation. And uh, when it finally quieted down, I said, gee, I really do appreciate that. And, And it was so brief and all, just like you said. But, you know, since you were concerned about accuracy, I feel that I should say that it wasn't the gold market. It was silver. And, you know, it wasn't London. It was Zurich. And, you know, it, it really wasn't a million dollars. It, it was more like a hundred thousand. And it wasn't me. It was my brother. <laughs> and he didn't make it. He lost it. <laughs> so that's when I started writing my own introductions. Freedom is the ability to live your life as you want to live it. There are all sorts of definitions of freedom, but that, to me, is the simplest and most direct and the most meaningful. That's what it comes down to. You want to control your own life. You want to live your life as you want to live it, not as George Bush or Bill Clinton or Abraham Lincoln or Teddy Roosevelt or anybody else thinks is best for you. And not only not as they think is best for you, but as your friends think is best for you or your relatives or anyone else. And we think of freedom necessarily most of the time, as being in relationship to the government, because the government seems to be the biggest inhibitor of our freedom, taking so much of what we earn every week, taking so much of our time consumed in dealing with regulations and rules that the government has set, taking so much control over our lives because of rules that it sets even on personal behavior, of of what kind of medicines you can take, of uh, what you can smoke and what you can drink and when you can do it and where you can do it and all of these things. Obviously, we don't have a great deal of control over our own lives, so we think of that. But that's not the end of it. There is much more to it. We give up freedom in many ways voluntarily to people that we know, to obligations that we make, to society in general, so-called. We also give up freedom to people we deal with in many uh, ways that we don't really need to. And libertarians understand a, a great deal about the relationship of freedom with regard to the state. And you can define libertarianism in many ways. I often say, when somebody says, what's a libertarian? I say, well, a libertarian is somebody who is really serious about reducing government to its absolute minimum. In other words, somebody who doesn't say, hey, we had a great victory because government only grew by 4% this year instead of 5%. Or, uh, gee, we stopped that new welfare bill or whatever it is. What a great victory for freedom. No, Libertarians are serious about reducing freedom to its absolute minimum, minimum, whatever that may be. But to me, all of libertarian thought, and this is, again, something where you might arrive at a different formulation, 
But to me, all of libertarian thought stems from one simple principle, an obvious principle and yet with so many ramifications. The principle is that everyone thinks for himself. Now, everyone does think for himself. Now, people, there, you know, everybody knows somebody who can't make a decision, so-called, who says, you know, I don't know what to do about this. Uh, tell me, what should I do? So forth and so on. Even that person is thinking for himself. He is deciding who it is that he wants to give him advice. And he may or may not take the advice, no matter how many times he asks for it. No matter how many people he asks for advice, he may wind up doing something that nobody has suggested. Everybody thinks for himself. And from that simple premise, we move outward to the point where we realize that things that government says that it's going to do never work because they are based on the unrealistic premise that people will stop thinking for themselves, that people will stop pursuing their own self-interest, that people will stop being individual human beings and be whatever the state wants them to be. So a law is passed governing health care by bureaucrats, and it assumes that doctors will no longer think for themselves that doctors will no longer make their own decisions, that now the doctors will do whatever the bureaucrats want. But they don't. And so the, the whole bureaucratic health care system fails. And we have in the process destroyed what was the greatest health care system the world has ever known with things like Medicare, Medicaid, the HMO Act, and on and on. And it's going to get worse with the Patient's Bill of Rights and the Prescription Drug Program and so on. So that's obvious. It, it's based on the idea that the grocer in Denver or the, the wholesaler in New Orleans or the doctor in Los Angeles or the lawyer in Atlanta, that these people who work 12 hours a day and have been pursuing a career are just going to continue doing this when they no longer can keep what they earn for working 12 hours a day, that they no longer will be able to make their own decisions as related to a certain particular business practice. So the denial of the premise that people think for themselves leads to the fact that government doesn't work. But that same premise applies to individual life as well, to our relationships with other people, to the business relationships that we set up, to the personal relationships, to our dealing with society, to everything that we do. If you don't recognize that everyone else thinks for himself, you find yourself in the position of doing what I believe is very unrealistic things, expecting unrealistic results from other people. For example, a very obvious example, there's an age-old traditional lore about salesmanship that if you want to be a good salesman, you've got to control the conversation. You've got to control the interview. You've got to dominate the interview. Fine. Go ahead and dominate the interview. Let the guy nod his head every time you say something doesn't mean he's going to buy anything for you, from you. It doesn't mean he's going to stop thinking for himself. It doesn't mean that he's going to get rid of his self-interest because you're stronger than he is. He's simply going to nod his head and so forth, walk away and go buy someplace else uh, where people don't treat him that way. You have, to do, you have to approach salesmanship in a much more realistic way, a way that begins by recognizing the humanity of the person you're dealing with, the fact that that person thinks for himself and is making his own decisions, and you have to enter his life rather than demanding that he enter yours for this period of time that you want to make this sale. So I wrote How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World to demonstrate that by following unrealistic premises, we give up a tremendous amount of freedom of our own free will, if you can stand the irony. That on our own, without any nudge from the government whatsoever, we manage to give away a great deal of the freedom that we could have. And so I built the book around three sections. The second section, if I may begin there, provides specific techniques for freeing yourself from government to a certain extent, on your own, without any help from the collective, from the Libertarian Party, from anybody else, but just simply doing things that you have control over to make yourself freer from the government, or from society, or from bad relationships of one kind or another, to satisfy obligations quickly so you can move on to a freer life, things of this sort. And the third part is making enormous changes in your life 
getting out of a bad marriage, getting out of a bad business relationship, getting out of something that you have thought was impossible to get out of and yet you knew was not right for you, uh, providing whatever techniques I could to help you do this particular thing. But now let's go back to the first part. The first part is a series of traps. And I defined a trap as being something that has three elements. First of all, it is an assumption that is widely held by people. Secondly, it is not true. At least, it should, I think it's not true if you examine it very closely. And third, it inhibits your freedom. By accepting this premise, this trap, you are giving up a great deal of your freedom. The most basic trap of all is what I call the identity trap. And that is the belief that you should be something other than what you are. That you must be the kind of person that other people expect of you. That you must live up to an ideal that somebody else states. And this can be in big ways, going into the business that your family has set out for you. Or it can be in small ways, being in a conversation out here in the foyer and saying what you think people expect you to say rather than what you really believe. I mean, there are huge, huge violations of the identity trap, and there are very trivial ones. But they are the most common kind of, of trap, and they're at the root pretty much of all the others. But there are others, like the morality trap, and that is believing that you must abide by a code of conduct that has been determined by somebody else rather than you, and which may not fit your nature at all. There are the government traps, a group of them, among which are the belief that government performs some useful function that you must support. <laughs> and uh, it's very hard for libertarians to accept that, the idea of that one. Um, but secondly, the belief that governments can keep you from being free, that because government has this great power, you don't have any power at all, which is not true. A very important trap is the despair trap, as I call it, which is the belief that other people can prevent you from being free, that you can't be free because other people won't let you be free. There's the utopia trap, the idea that you can't be free until society is free, and therefore you have to change society, and that that's more important than changing yourself or changing, not changing yourself, but your relationship to the world and the things that you do. And all of this, re there are other traps as well, but they all revolve around these three basic elements, and that is that they are widely held beliefs that on closer examination will not stand up and in some way or other inhibit your own freedom of action so that you are not living the kind of life that you can imagine would be better for you. Now, I begin the book with three basic premises in discussing the identity trap. The first is the realization that every individual, by nature, by virtue of being a human being, is pursuing happiness. And what do I mean by happiness? Well, happiness can be de defined almost any way that you choose to do so, and you can reach a whole lot of conclusions depending on the way you define it. But really, happiness, I think, is very simple. It is the feeling of well-being, a mental feeling that we get. Now, Happiness can come from watching a good movie. Happiness can come from making love. Happiness can come from reading a good book or listening to good music. Happiness can come from doing good works. Happiness can come from making a million dollars. Happiness can come from all different kinds of things. But what they all have in common is that they all give the person who has done these, this particular thing the feeling of well-being as opposed to a feeling of discomfort or anxiety or... Uh, unfulfilledness or whatever it may be. The second premise is that every individual is different. That what will provide happiness for one person will not necessarily provide happiness for another. And of course, this is a very important realization concerning the identity trap. It is why it is the, the falling into the identity trap that gets your mother to say, if you just live this way, you will be happy. Take it from me. This is what I did. And it worked out perfectly. I'm happy. You don't see me unhappy, so forth and so on. So why can't you do this and be happy too? Because I'm not you, mother. And
Fortunately, I didn't have a mother like that, but I've seen enough movies about Jewish mothers <laughs> to, to know how common it is. Um, but you get the point. The third premise is, and this, I may not have the best terminology in the world, so forgive me if there's a little bit of ambiguity in it, and that is you control only yourself. Now, by that I mean that really what it comes down to is you cannot think and make decisions for other people. You can only hope to influence other people by creating alternatives that you hope will lead them to choose one thing over another. Now, the alternatives that you create may be sticking a gun in the person's rib, but he still will decide whether he wants to risk death uh, and uh, or obey you or whatever. Uh, or the alternatives that you may create will be offering him money or being a good person, uh, helping that person, whatever it may be. But the point is that he will still make the final decisions. And the irony is that if you think you're going to control others, you wind up being controlled by them. That when you decide that you must control your son, for example, or your business partner or somebody else, you give up control to that extent over your own life. Because now you must pay attention to everything that person does. Now you must follow that person around and stop him every time he's going to do the wrong thing. Now you must react every time he acts. You must respond in some way. And you are no longer initiating the action in your life. You are now a passive person who is responding to what that person is activating from one thing to the next. And so you have in the process given up control over your own life by trying to control others. Now, in the limited time we have available, I thought what I might do is to run through one trap just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. And the trap I will take, on the one hand, may seem so trivial that it might seem to trivialize the book, but on the other hand, it may to you personally be so controversial uh, that you think, well, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So either way, I'm pro probably going to lose. But uh, one way or another, let's take the unselfishness trap as the example of a trap. The unselfishness trap is the belief that you uh, should be, you should put others' interests ahead of your own, uh, that you must live for the benefit of others, and that you should not think of yourself first. And it's a very common belief. It's common to many religions. It is common to many philosophies. It is so common that people never bother to justify it. Nobody ever says, well, here's why you should put others first. They just say, you can't do that. You have to put, uh, you have to think of others before yourself. Or, or it comes to you in the form of, why are you thinking of yourself? Is this all about you? Uh, uh, why do we have to do what you want? Why can't you ever do what other people want? Well, Unselfishness is based on a very realistic concept. It overlooks the most important and basic factor having to do with it. Assuming that unselfishness were even possible, and I hope to show in a moment that it isn't, but assuming that it were possible, unselfishness could only achieve a purpose if there were some selfish person around to receive the benefits that the unselfish person is going to bestow. So in other words, you have to have some inferior being <laughs> uh, around all the time. What's the matter? Uh, you have to have some inferior being all around all the time for you to be able to act on your own selfishness. And by an inferior being, I mean somebody who is not of your great moral elevated status, who is willing to accept this and be selfish. And if that isn't perfectly clear, then let me put it this way. Let's just imagine that happiness were a big red rubber ball. And I happen to possess that big red rubber ball. But of course, I don't want to be selfish and hold this to myself, so I hand it to this gentleman here, and I give up the happiness so that he can have it. But he doesn't want to be uh, selfish either. He's, he's an elevated moral human being, so he hands it to the gentleman next to him, who hands it to the woman behind him, who hands it to Sharon Harris, who hands it to the uh, gentleman behind him. And it goes around the room, and eventually it comes back to me again. And what in the world has been accomplished by all of this? Once again, 
It serves no purpose whatsoever unless there is a selfish person somewhere at the end of the line is going to get this and say, hey, thank you, this is exactly what I've wanted. And, and I feel no guilt whatsoever about keeping it. Uh, but barring that, the whole thing has been an enormous waste of time. Is that what we were put on earth here to do, to hand this red rubber ball around from one person to another? Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you should never do anything for anybody else. My heavens, no. I mean, I love my wife. Can you imagine the satisfaction I get when I give her something that I know she really wanted and I see that look on her face? Ah, that look on her face. (laughs) Um, you, You get my point. What I'm saying is that there is, of course, many, many good reasons to do things for other people. But this idea that we should do it because we have a a moral obligation to put others ahead of ourselves is not only unwise, it is stupid, and it is self-defeating. And it is also based on the idea that there are really unselfish people in this world, which is not true. I said earlier that everyone is seeking happiness. Now... The way that people seek happiness may differ from one person to another. Uh, one person thinks the way he's going to be happy is if he robs that bank and gets that million dollars and lives on the Riviera for the rest of his life. That's the way that he wants to try to satisfy his happiness. Somebody else wants to do it by building a business that provides products and services that people want, and he'll get in exchange for that the things that uh, he needs in order to provide for his family and to do the things that he wants. Other people, like Mother Teresa, have decided that happiness is going to come from to, to them from doing good works for other people. And why do you suppose Mother Teresa does it? Because it gives her the feeling of well-being. You don't believe me? And we, unfortunately, unfortunately, we can't prove this right now. But all you'd have to do to prove it is to put her in handcuffs and prevent her from doing good works for other people and say... Do you feel better now that you're not having to do all these things for other people? And what do you think she's going to say? Oh, thank you. God, I was getting so sick of feeding those poor people. No, no. She's going to say, please let me out of this. I've got work to do. I've got things I have to do. Why do you have to do them? Well, she wouldn't answer in that way, but she has to do them because that's the only way her mind will be at peace. For whatever reason that she came to that mental state, that makes for her happiness doing things for other people, that is her. And she is not you. She is a different person. And she cannot serve as a role model for you. As a matter of fact, virtually no one in the world can serve as a role model for you because they are not you. Because you are a unique individual. And I had a conversation today at lunch with a very intelligent person, uh, And he was pointing out that once you, uh, and I'm uh, undoubtedly going to butcher his remarks, but uh, he was pointing out that once you abandon the traditional norms of society and anything goes, it leads to what might be, uh, these are my words, social anarchy and people making ridiculous decisions and so forth. But there really are only two alternatives when you come down to it, and that is Either I decide how I am going to live my life or somebody else is going to decide. And who is that somebody else going to be? Who is this great, wise person who knows all, who is omniscient, who, who knows everything about everybody in this world and knows exactly how my actions are going to affect everybody else in the world so that he can make a decision as to how I should live and know that it is not going to lead to bad consequences for somebody else. There is no such person. It isn't you, it isn't you, it isn't you. It has to be me. Because I'm the person who is going to experience the consequences. And that's the rub. If I make the wrong decision, I'm going to pay for it. If I make the right decision, I'm going to be rewarded for it. So how in the world could it be anybody else that makes a decision? One of the problems with government is that the people who are making all the decisions are making decisions with your money, not with their money. So naturally, 
They feel no sense of responsibility as we know it because not one of them will suffer no matter how many people die as a result of the bill that they pass. No matter how many people have their lives ruined by the bill that they pass, they will never experience any personal sacrifice as a result of what they have done. It will never interfere. It won't stop them from getting reelected to begin with. But even more important, if somebody loses millions and millions of dollars as a result of this bad law that was passed, not one of those congressmen will have to pony up so much as one dollar to help defray the cost to people of the damage that they have done. We know that. We know that this leads invariably to bad decisions. The same thing has got to be true in the rest of life. That if the person who is not going to experience the consequences is not the person making the decision, you can't expect that the decision is going to be completely responsible. It may not be even when the person who's going to experience the consequences uh, uh, makes the decision. But to let somebody else do it who will not suffer the consequences if it's wrong makes no sense whatsoever. Now... You get my point about selfishness, I hope, whether or not you agree with it. One last thing about it is that because everybody is different, we have to realize that the gifts we give to people need to be very carefully thought out because we can't say, boy, I know what I like, therefore I know what somebody else would like. I know what would be good. If I give this person a helping hand, for all I know, I'm ruining his life in the process. Let me give you a very trivial example. I even put this in the book. It happened so long ago. Uh, the book first came out in 1973, and then we updated it. I updated it, and we published a 28th anniversary, 25th anniversary edition in 1998, which I did not rewrite the book because I knew it or even edited it at all because I knew it would lead to a whole new book, and I didn't have the time. So I just wrote an afterword to explain anything I'd learned in the last 25 years. And because I had learned so little, it only took a few pages. Um, but anyway, I'm, I, I digress. Um, this incident happened uh, way, way back around 1968 or 1970. I was living in an apartment house. The landlady who took pity on this single man who was living there, I was actually young at the time, uh, would try to do nice things for me. And one day she brought this cake over for me and said, I baked this cake and I thought you might like to have a big slab of it. And I said, well, thank you very much. And after she, after she left, I looked at the cake and I thought, oh, I can't even remember what kind of cake it was. But I looked at it and I thought, this is not, I don't like this kind of cake. Now, all right. So she did not succeed in making me happy, which was her intention. But it goes beyond that. Because now I had to figure out how to get the plate back to her without being asked how I liked the cake. And because one of the things that I had long since adopted as part of my code of conduct was the need for absolute honesty, which is another subject entirely, I did not want to just say, oh, boy, that was good cake. And one of the reasons I adopted as part of my code of conduct, absolute honesty, was because I knew that if I said, oh, that was good cake, tomorrow there'd be another one on my doorstep and we'd have to start the whole process all over again. Now, to this, I don't remember how I got the plate back, but I remember I didn't get kicked out of the apartment house, so I must have solved the problem somehow. But the point was, this woman who was trying to do something good for me did something bad for me. She occupied a certain amount of my time that was necessary to try to figure out uh, how to get this plate back to her without having to be confronted about the value of the cake. And, uh, you know, I could have been using this time to, to write something, to, to earn a living in some way or another. It's a trivial, trivial example, but I use it because it's so, such an obvious example. And this happens all the time. Uh, we see it in our lives that people who are trying to do good for other people wind up not just not doing good, but actually doing bad. It is the so-called law of unintended consequences which I don't happen to believe in in government. I don't believe that any politician really intended to do good. Um, that, <laughs> that wasn't the purpose. But if that's what Republicans want to believe, let them believe it. Um, the point is 
that this happens all of the time, these unintended consequences. Now, again, I'm not saying you should never do anything for anybody else, but give people a break, for heaven's sakes. Don't make their life worse off by indiscriminate gift-giving or indiscriminate do-gooding, but save this for the people you know best, the people where you can feel confident that you're doing something for them, something that can really be positive in their lives, whether it's a simple little gift or helping them on a new career that they're interested in and that you're sure that where you're, what you're doing is really not getting in the way. But of course, when you really carry that to its logical conclusion, there's one person in this world that you know more about than you know about anybody else in the world where everything you do for that person, you can be almost assured will be to that person's benefit instead of to that person's detriment. And that, of course, is you yourself. So I think that you should hug somebody today. (laughs) Do good for somebody today. Support your local self. And so that's the unselfishness trap. And I give that as an example. And as I say, you may think, well, I knew all that already, so what would I ever get out of this book? Uh, But try on for size the idea that government does good things that you ought to support or that you should live by a code of conduct that has been written by somebody else and so on. And I hope we would get into more controversial things. Before we break for questions, I want to point out that I am not saying that it is that I know any way by which you can be 100% free, meaning that you can live exactly the life that you want to live at every moment of every day without any uh, drudgery, or without any having to do anything that you don't happen to want to do at that particular moment. But my belief is that it is possible to live 70 to 90 percent free and that I believe with no scientific evidence whatsoever that most people live in a state of 10 to 30 percent freedom, uh, what Henry Thoreau called lives of quiet desperation, uh, where people are just simply trying to keep out of trouble, trying to keep out of debt, trying to just not get fired, trying to do whatever is necessary not to rock the boat, trying not to have another argument with the spouse, trying whatever it may be. And I'm giving you uh, obviously an extreme example, but you know what I'm saying. And that's another area of the book where I talk about positive choices that we make where we're choosing between two alternatives, each of which we think of as good, and we're just trying to decide which would be the better of the two, or negative choices where we see that the two choices or more are all bad, and we're trying to figure out which would be the least bad. And too often, people are making, in small ways and in large ways in life, negative choices where they are trying to minimize the bad rather than trying to determine which would be the very best thing, which would enhance my life the most. And I believe that there is a great deal, as I said at the outset, that each of us can do in his own life to make things better. But one of the traps we want to stay out of, which I did not identify uh so precisely in the book is what we might just call the perfection trap. And that is the belief that this should all work out perfectly, that you should be able to to do everything right and everything perfectly. I can't tell you how many mistakes I've made in my life. I mean, how many stupid things that I have done in my life, things that I look back on that I'm actually ashamed of and that I hope nobody ever found out about. Um, Uh, How many times that I set out to do something and didn't succeed? How many things of that sort have happened? And yet here I am at 68 years old. I have been blessed with what I think is the most wonderful life possible. I've been able to live in three countries. I've had books on the bestseller list. I was given the honor of running for president twice. I am married to the most wonderful woman in the world. And all this in spite of all those mistakes. Because more than anything else, it's an attitude. It is a determination that you are not going to be unfree if you don't have to be. And I wrote the book and titled it, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, precisely because, first of all, I wanted 
anybody to understand that I was not talking about changing the world. I was talking about the world that we're living in right now. Not that utopia in the future that we're hoping to build someday, but the unfree world we live in now. And rather than saying how you can be free in an unfree world, I said in a way that would ordinarily offend my own sense of modesty how I found freedom in an, in an unfree world because I wanted people to know that this had already been done by one person at least. So we were not talking about blue sky. But the point is that despite all these mistakes, despite these things that I'm even ashamed of, I have been able to live this blessed life. And I, and I realized just a few weeks ago that when I die, I want my wife uh, to, to put on my tombstone. <laughs> um, I did not do everything that I wanted to accomplish. I did not become everything that I wanted to be. But because I reached for the stars, I still was able to reach the top of the world. And that's what I'm hoping you will do, that you will not let people tell you you can't do it, but you will reach for the stars, and that you will discover, seek out, identify, and act on that person that is you, who is not Harry Brown or Bill Clinton or anybody else or even the person you admire most in the world. That person is you, and you are unlike anyone else in the world. And it is your life, not that person's life. So you have to make the decisions. But if you do make the decisions, you are going to be able to live in a much freer way. And that's what I want for you. I want you to have the very best. I want you to be able to live free in an unfree world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. That was excellent. Now, we have a number of questions that our audience would like to ask you. First, I recall you saying in How I Found Freedom that you define morality as being, quote, what works for you. Is my recollection correct? Can you define morality more specifically? Um, you know, I can't tell you exactly what precise definition I came up with, but it was not so flippant as what works for you. Uh, which, in fact, I think the reason that, that the person used that quote is because that's the disparaging way that people who don't agree with this philosophy say, oh, yeah, morality is just whatever works. Morality is the code of conduct that you believe is going to bring you the most happiness. And I have a, a very lengthy section of the book about developing your own code of conduct, the questions you should ask yourself to determine how it is you want to live. There are a number of things that uh, I came to years and years, decades ago, as conclusions of what would be the best way for me to live. And contrary to this, uh, whatever works for you, I mean, just go ahead, be a libertine, and so forth, my code of conduct includes such things as absolute scrupulous honesty. And I can give you just one example of the importance of that. Uh, I would never, ever lie to anyone because the moment I lie to someone else and my wife sees me lie to someone else, from that day forward, she is going to have to wonder if I tell her something, if I have lied to her. But if she can see me actually seem to uh, undergo some discomfort in the short term because of being honest to someone else, she can begin to trust me. And only with that kind of a relationship do I believe is it possible for us to have what we have had over the last 16 years, a relationship in which whatever happens, whatever differences we might have, whatever friction might come from two people living in the same house together, we always know that we can talk about it because uh, nobody's going to try to sugarcoat anything. Nobody's going to pull any punches. Nobody's going to, to uh, try to hide anything. So honesty has a very practical reason. It's not just, well, whatever works for you. It is because honesty does work. 
It is for much the same reason why stealing is a very, very bad thing to allow to seep into your code of conduct. And, and it leads to all sorts of other things. Uh, if you're going to come up with this code of conduct in the next five minutes, God, it might include almost anything in the world. But if you give it some thought and really reason out what the long-term consequences of things are, not to society, but the long-term consequences to you yourself, you may be surprised at the things that you suddenly realize need to be a very important part of what you do. I hope I've answered the question. To what extent were you influenced by Ayn Rand's writings? Well, in a literal sense or intellectual sense, not at all. Uh, but it is, uh, it just so happens that at the time I was going through a period when I had to make some very, very important changes and it seemed as though everybody around me was opposed to what I was doing, and I wasn't going to let that stop me because I knew that I was doing what was necessary and right uh, as far as I was concerned and was going to do it, it was very comforting to me to suddenly start reading Ayn Rand's novels uh, that somebody had handed me a year or two or three before and that I had never picked up. But for some reason in the middle of this turmoil, I started reading the novels and it was very comforting to me to be able to read these about someone standing up for himself. And uh, so I, I have to say that I took a great deal of comfort and inf inspiration from her writings. But what I believe I was believing before then, and I have to say that I have severe differences with her on the subject of morality. I discuss in the book how I found freedom in an unfree world, the concept that there are three different kinds of morality. One is uh, what I would call a universal morality, which is a, a morality that must apply to everyone and it's been handed down from someplace, whether it's from Ayn Rand or God or through, you know, your favorite spokesman or whatever it is, and therefore it's not subject to challenge at all. There is also the absolute morality which is a code of conduct that somebody believes will make anybody who adopts it happy. And I don't believe that there is such a thing. But uh, obviously a lot of people do. And then there is what I call the personal morality, the morality that you have thought out and you have come to because you believe in it, because you have thought it out for yourself and therefore you can abide by it. You don't have to say at some crucial point when you have to make a decision and your emotions are raging and people are beckoning at you to do this and there are all sorts of temptations and so on. Uh, you don't have to say to yourself, gee, is it going to hurt so much if I violate the moral code in this way right now? You're not going to feel that way because you figured this out for yourself and you know, yes, it is going to hurt if I give up my moral, moral uh, position at this particular time. And so you are much more likely to adhere to it and stick to it. Okay, a couple of questions about differences in the revisions of your book or, or I guess a recent uh, revision and the issue of political involvement. In the first edition of your Freedom book, you seem to be opposed to political involvement. Isn't your running for president a violation of the spirit of the first edition? And another one, why did you run for president and would you do it again? Uh, yes, I would do it again. Oh, as a matter of fact, I did do it again. Therefore, that's out of the way. I don't have to do that in, in, still a third time. Uh, yes, and, I, and to set that straight, I have no intention of ever running again. Up to, up to a week ago, when somebody would ask me that question, I would say, it's not very likely, but I'm keeping my options open. Uh, boy, have I become a politician. Uh, and the reason for that was I was a party to a lawsuit to uh, abolish all the federal campaign laws. And uh, it, we intended to take this to the Supreme Court. And if I had declared that I will never be a candidate again, I would have lost standing as a plaintiff and could no longer be a party to the to it. And so I, uh, in effect, said, "Well, it is not very not very very likely. That's uh, that's very slim chance. But I won't say it couldn't possibly happen. And I wouldn't say now that it couldn't possibly happen. But I can say that I have no intention whatsoever of ever running again." Uh, with regard to the book, um, what I said in the book was that I had, uh, had not voted in years, and, and I hadn't, and I continued not to vote, that I saw no particular point to political action. And at some point, I saw a point to political action. Uh, I did not feel that 
this was necessarily going to change the world, but it brings me to uh, an important point, which was part of the reason for writing this book in the first place. And that is, suppose we make an effort to try to change the government, try to change America, try to change the world, and we don't succeed. Will it have all been in vain if we do that? Because if it would have all been in vain, then it is, I think, absolutely stupid to undertake it, given the odds against success. But I don't think it would be in vain because I have found that almost every important person in my life that I have treasured has been a libertarian. My wife is a libertarian. My literary agent was a libertarian. The publishers of my newsletter were libertarians. Uh, the editor of all of almost all of my books was a libertarian. I mean, it could go on and on. But best friends have always been libertarians. Why? Because these are the easiest people to deal with. These people never come up with unrealistic premises. They never say, hey, this is what we're going to do and everybody's going to just love this, so forth and so on. Now, come on, buddy. You know, not, you never this. You never have to explain to anybody. Uh, no, no, look, you don't understand. People don't act that way. People don't respond that way. They know all this already because of their attitude towards human nature and life and so on. That's what made them libertarians. And to whatever extent this political action, to whatever, whatever extent all those radio and television appearances help to expand the circle of libertarians from which I someday may be able to draw usefully new friends, new business associates, and so forth, I will feel it has been worthwhile. Uh, and plus, it was a great deal of fun. It was also a, a great deal of work at times. I won't deny that. But it was, I think, the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. So the idea that I sacrificed myself. Now, maybe a lot of people who did nothing but licked envelopes were sacrificing themselves. They didn't get to be on television. They didn't get to shake hands with so many people. They didn't get to do all these other things. Uh, they didn't get to stay at the Motel 4 and, and things of this sort. <laughs> but... But you get my point. Uh, this this was not some kind of unrelieved drudgery on my part, and I I uh, don't want you to go away with that feeling. We got time for another two. Yeah. Uh, someone asked, "Have you seen the movie A Wonderful Life?" And how would you assess that movie given your views? Uh, well, I'm, if there's anybody here who's never seen that uh, uh, movie, then uh, I, I guess. You know, you're just absolutely culturally deprived. Uh, not that I think it was one of the greatest movies ever made, but it certainly was an entertaining movie the first ten times my wife made me sit through it. <laughs> no, actually, she does watch it every year at Christmas time. I, I quit about 1987, something like that. Um, I think that the, the premise of it is not only a wonderful, dramatic uh, device, but it is a learning device when he... Um, when he was put through the experience of seeing what life would have been like if he had not lived. I think that was a wonderful thing. And uh, But I also, of course, saw the thing just dripping with altruism uh, because what happened was that all these other people would be worse off, which did not really relieve his personal discomfort. All the things that he had wanted to do, he had been deprived of doing. And so what the object of the whole story was, you shouldn't be whining about all these ter uh, all these things that you wanted to do and you never got a chance to do because look at how happy you made everybody else. Well, that's fine. And maybe for one person out of a hundred, that might be the answer. But I can tell you with no scientific evidence again whatsoever that for 99 out of a hundred people, uh, that wouldn't get the job done. And so I, I have to say it was a wonderfully successful movie from a dramatic standpoint, not all that successful from the standpoint of making a point. Yeah. I could give you names of other movies I thought did. Okay. Well, that might be interesting. Did you want to? Well, one of my favorites is The Americanization of Emily and with James Garner. Um, that's just a fabulous movie. First of all, it's absolutely and totally anti-war, um, which sort of sums my attitude on that, too. As I said yesterday in the panel, I'm not opposed to defending the country. I am opposed to invading other countries. And um, so, obviously, I um, 
respond to the movie favorably for that purpose. But it was also very funny. Uh, it was also dramatically very good. But more than anything else, it finished. The movie finished with this enormous, wonderful moral quandary at the end that anybody who sees argues about afterward, which is good because it sets people to thinking about what is the purpose of life? What is the reason I'm here? How should I be making moral decisions? And it ends with the question of whether to st- he should stick by a particular principle he has expounded and go to prison uh, you know, for something that he shouldn't be going to prison for in the first place, or whether he should do what some other people want, stay out of prison, marry the girl he loves, and live happily ever after. And I'm way oversimplifying it, of course, because I can't stand here and tell you the whole story. But it is just fabulous. And when the picture is over, any two people who see this picture are going to start arguing about, uh, he should have done this. No, he should have done that. And, and it's terrific. It's one of the best pictures. And we don't need to go on with movie reviews. <laughs> okay. And one final quick question. Since you're not going to run for president, what are you doing now? Oh. Um, well, I'm glad you asked. I'm looking for a job in case anybody's, you know, has a McDonald's franchise or anything. Uh, no, I'm writing and, and um, speaking wherever I can and not as often as I would like to. So if anybody's got any events coming up, anything of that sort. And I am working on a book uh, which I in, am titling The War Racket, How Politicians, Use Ameri- uh, How Politicians Sacrifice Americans to Their Own Ends. And I hope to publish that on the Internet in about uh, three months from now. And um, generally speaking, I intend to stay in this field, that is, talking and writing about human liberty and so on. Let me leave you with one final thought. Oh, I should mention that for those who are here in the room uh, hearing me today, I will be, right after this, going over to the laissez-faire book uh, department, and I'll be glad to sign copies of this or any of my other books if you are so inclined to get one. If you're watching on C-SPAN, you can go to the website HB Books. That's HB for Harry Brown, hbbooks.com, and there you will find all of the books of, of mine that are still in print, including How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, the subject of this address. But the thought I'd like to leave you with is I talk in the book about this, this whole second part is freedom from government, freedom from uh, social restrictions, freedom uh, from bad marriages, freedom from jealousy, freedom from guilt, freedom from a lot of different things with techniques of how to make yourself freer in each of these areas. But at the end of the book, I point out that the ultimate freedom, the, the freedom that will give you the greatest uh, return on your money, so to speak, is freedom from the desire to control others. When you realize that you have no ability to control others in a way that will be satisfying to you, and you realize also that the attempt to do so is going to tie up your life, and you realize that the answer is not to make this person be the kind of person you want to be, but to find the kind of person who is that kind of person you want to be that you, who is, pardon me, find the person who is already the kind of person you want to be with, instead of trying to make this company the kind of company you want to work for, but to find the kind of company that is already what you want to work for, that this is the answer to minimizing the expense, the effort, uh, the drudgery, and so forth, rather than trying to change others. And it is very difficult to lose that desire but it can be done. And when you do, you will experience a freedom unlike any other in the world. I believe it is possible to be free in an unfree world, or at least a lot freer than most people settle for. And again, I wish you the very, very best. Thank you for being here today.